Hello and welcome to this lecture on the three major stages of development, but focusing on the embryonic period from the third week to the eighth week after fertilisation. And the reason we're focusing on that particular time is because this is the sensitive period when major morphological abnormalities develop. That's major abnormalities affecting the body systems, such as the limbs, the skull, the brain, and so on. Because of this, it's also emotionally challenging. Uh, it's a disturbing subject to talk about, and therefore we have to be aware of that when we're dealing with it, both for ourselves and also for others. So in the lecture, we'll explore this critical, sensitive period of development, and then we'll look at the causes of some major morphological abnormalities and the implications that this may have for parents and for children as a consequence. So the three major periods of development in human development are, first of all, the pre-embryo, and then the embryonic period, and then subsequently the fetal period. And we have a little calendar to the side to illustrate that there's time involved here. And these are of very different lengths. So the pre-embryo is from fertilisation to about two and a half weeks later. And the embryonic period is from that two and a half weeks up to about eight weeks after fertilisation. And then the fetal period is from nine weeks after fertilisation up till the time of birth. Now these are technical terms. So people will often talk about embryos when they really mean the pre-embryo, or a fetus when they really mean the embryonic stage. But there's value in having technical, defined terms in medical terminology so that we can speak with precision. Just be aware that it's not the same as the common language uses of these particular terms. You can see they're also very different lengths. The fetal period is much longer than pre-embryo and embryo and occupies the major part of the developmental process. Another thing to point out at this point is the language around the timing of pregnancy or the time of gestation. Since nobody knows exactly when they became pregnant, despite the belief that you might be able to tell that, it's normal to time a pregnancy from the flow phase of the last menstrual period. And on average, that's about two weeks before ovulation when pregnancy can actually begin. And therefore, time of pregnancy, as described by doctors and nurses, is the time after fertilisation plus two weeks. So when it's commonly said that pregnancy lasts for 40 weeks, that's the time of pregnancy. The time which you're actually pregnant is 38 weeks, and this can lead to confusion. So in these lectures, I'll generally specify time after fertilisation, if that's what I mean. Also, it's conventional to describe pregnancy into three trimesters, each of which is about three months long. So doctors or nurses may speak about the first, second or third trimester. These are chronological divisions and they do not correspond to significant periods of change within the embryo itself. Whereas the term pre-embryo, embryo and fetus refers to quite specific periods of time when very different things are happening. For instance, in the pre-embryonic period, that zero to two and a half weeks, the pre-embryo is highly regulative. So these are the stages at which twins can form. Two completely separate or even more individuals can form during the pre-embryonic period. Similarly, if some cells were damaged during the pre-embryonic period, there's a very reasonable chance that the remaining cells will just divide more frequently and make up for that damage. So perhaps unexpectedly, in that pre-embryonic period, the pre-embryo is quite resistant to various kinds of damage. However, that very quickly moves into the embryonic period from two and a half weeks to the end of the eighth week after fertilisation. And that's a highly sensitive period. It's when the major body systems are laid down and at that stage they're very sensitive to disturbance and therefore this is when major morphological abnormalities can develop. The remaining fetal period should not be assumed to be entirely safe from outside influences either. During this period tissues are maturing 
So, for instance, the bones are forming, the teeth are forming. Perhaps most crucially, the brain itself is developing. And therefore, things which happen during the fetal period might have an influence on these tissues as they mature. So it would not bring about a major morphological change, but it could bring about a significant functional change. Now, just looking again at some of the early stages, in this diagram we can see the amniotic cavity in green on the top, and then below that the yellow yolk sac. And if we were inside the amniotic cavity, looking down at the floor, we would see the primitive streak forming as is described in more detail in the lecture on gastrulation. And this moment is the time of individuation. It's when the individual is formed and twins can no longer form. And it also determines the main body axis, left and right, head and tail. And as we saw in the lecture on gastrulation, it also leads to the formation of a third germ layer, the mesoderm. So a very significant point in development. So recapping that with the illustrations which are labelled, we can see the amniotic cavity, the yolk sac, and between the two, the bilaminar disc in which the embryo will begin to form. And then in the lower illustrations in the picture, you can see the primitive streak, which determines where the main body axis actually is. Looking at the process of development of the embryo, again from inside the amniotic cavity. Imagine that you're a, a tiny diver swimming inside the amniotic fluid, looking down at the floor of the amniotic cavity. What we would then see is the neural tube beginning to form as the ectoderm rolls up, fuses in the middle, and then begins to extend towards the head, towards the brain end, and towards the tail, gradually fusing to form the neural tube. And on either side of that are the somites. It's actually quite helpful to look at a photograph, a scanning electron micrograph, in fact, of a real human embryo, a stage that corresponds to those previous diagrams. Up at the head, you can see the developing brain. The neural tube runs down the midline, and on either side, there are little blocks of mesodermal tissue called somites, which will contribute to the vertebrae, among other things. The spine leads down to the tail, and in the background of the picture, the little kind of sac-like structure that you can see is in fact the yolk sac. So you're looking down on the yolk sac from above. During this time, there's considerable expansion, mostly of the extra embryonic membranes, in particular the amniotic cavity. So the amniotic cavity will expand, becomes filled with amniotic fluid, and gradually will take up most of the space in the uterus. And we'll look at that in more detail in another lecture. If we're to look at the embryo from the side, so this is a, a lateral or side view of the embryo, during the embryonic period, you can see it, it gradually becomes more curved as we move from left to right. The head becomes much larger and a significant amount of growth takes place and the embryo is rising into the amniotic cavity. So in the, the third illustration on the right, then the embryo is projecting into the amniotic cavity and is surrounded by amniotic fluid at that point. In this electron micrograph, we can see a human embryo seen from the side. And this one is perhaps about 27, 28 days after fertilization. So in the earlier parts of the embryonic period. And the bulge of the heart is marked with an H in the diagram, and the umbilical cord is marked with a U. You can see the curve of the somites sweeping around the back, and the arm bud and the leg bud are visible as well. Now, it can be difficult to interpret these images in three dimensions, so I brought along a model embryo to help us understand what the three-dimensional arrangement is. And here's the model embryo. And here we can see the curve of the head coming around to where the mouth will be. This is the bulge of the heart. This is the arm bud and this is the leg bud. And we can see the somites sweeping around and ending up in a distinct tail. Now, normally the tail will diminish uh, and disappear. 
but in a very few human babies, perhaps one per 100,000 live births, the tail persists and the baby is born with a persisting prehensile tail. As I say, that's very rare and perhaps that's a shame. It might be fun if we had tails again. Looking at the, the whole structure that's been conceived, the conceptus, as it were, as a whole, here we can see the embryo inside its chorionic cavity and it's surrounded by its amniotic membrane. And the little sac that you can see to the side of the embryo, just to the right of it, that's the yolk sac as it steadily diminishes in relative size. And all round about, the cloudy structures are the developing placenta as they engage with the uterine tissue. And the limb buds in this slightly later picture are beginning to take on more recognisable form as the arm and leg of the human. This is a particularly significant diagram because it summarises the time when different body systems are at their most sensitive. So you could see, for instance, marked in dark green, the heart is highly sensitive between weeks three and six after fertilisation. It remains fairly sensitive for the rest of the embryonic period, but after that time, you're unlikely to get a major heart abnormality, a major abnormality of the heart's form. You may disturb its function as the heart matures, but it will still be an intact heart. The major defects of heart development are initiated during that three to six week period. Similarly, you can see the sensitive periods for the central nervous system, the eyes, ears, limbs, and so on. And these timings are actually very helpful in working out what may have gone wrong during the course of a pregnancy. If, for instance, we were to observe that a baby had a heart defect and a central nervous system defect, but its eyes and ears and upper limbs were normal, that might lead us to investigate whether or not something had happened during the third to fourth week after fertilisation. So that would be weeks five to seven of pregnancy, which might have brought about these defects, might have caused them in some way. So you can use this diagram retrospectively by looking at the nature of abnormalities, which often come not singly, but in combination to find out when something might have gone wrong during the course of development. And here's an image of an embryo uh, to reinforce this view of the embryo in this embryonic period with the major body structures being formed and laid down at that point. Now, I've said several times that things might go wrong, so let's explore that in a little more detail. And I'm going to ask some questions and offer answers as best we can. There is still much that we do not know about this complex and challenging area of development and indeed medicine. So we'll look at how common they are. We'll look at the forms that major abnormalities can take. We'll make our best guesses as to what might cause them. And there are three categories, genes, substances or teratogens and unknown factors. Then we'll look at the timing for teratogens, for agents which might cause abnormalities. And then we'll look at the nature of them. We'll comment on how people might feel about this. This is a very sensitive and very important area. It often worries expectant parents greatly. They're worried that something might be wrong with their baby. And sometimes that can lead them to feel guilty when, of course, there is no cause for them to feel guilty about something that happened to their baby. And then finally, we'll look at how frequency can be reduced. And that would feed back into our initial question of how common they are. Fortunately, in Western Europe, the frequency of developmental abnormalities has been falling. And there's every reason to expect that we could make it fall still further in the future. So how common are developmental abnormalities? And the answer is they're actually much more common than people realise. In Western Europe, where rates are relatively good, about 2.5% of all babies have a significant developmental abnormality detected at birth. That's one baby in 40. That's far more common than people, even sometimes doctors, realise. And we're actually speaking about abnormalities which might have an effect on function. If you were to look at minor variations, well, to be honest, 
almost everybody has minor variations of one kind or another. But in addition to that, there's another 2.5% that are detected in infancy and childhood. So there are things like deafness, for instance, which may not be detected at birth, or problems with movement, which become evident when the child, when the infant starts to walk. And at that point, heart defects can also become detectable because the extra work required from the heart might show up a problem that had previously been undetected. In addition to that, an unknown number of fertilizations do not lead to pregnancies. They terminate spontaneously after fertilization has taken place. Now, obviously, if fertilization does not lead to a pregnancy, it's very hard to know that it happened at all. And therefore, that's why we're not sure about the total number. The highest estimate I know is that perhaps 75% of all fertilizations terminate spontaneously. And if one ever manages to retrieve one of those fertilizations, it looks as if it's a genetic cause, that something significant has gone wrong with the genetic expression in the developing fertilized egg and that it has terminated itself spontaneously as a result of that. As I say, that's something of a guess. and We don't actually know exactly what proportion do terminate. We merely know that it's a significant proportion. And of course, we haven't looked at complex problems which are not detected until much later in life. So there is already evidence that things that happen during the fetal period can have an influence on how likely you are to have a number of conditions as an adult. And that includes cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and even possibly mental conditions such as schizophrenia. Something has happened in the course of development which has increased the chances that you will suffer from these as an adult. And at the moment, we have very little idea what these factors affecting the pregnancy might have been. But obviously, the implications of this are massive. And if we could tell what those factors were, we might have another way of addressing these adult illnesses during the early stages of development. Now, this is a table from uh, a survey of abnormalities in Western Europe. And you can see the rate here is expressed per 10,000 pregnancies. So 256 per 10,000 means that that's our 2.5% that we spoke about previously. And looking at the frequency of each of these, you can see that congenital heart defects are the most common single kind, moving down through limb defects, defects of the urinary system and then of the nervous system. Uh, and part of that includes neural tube defects, so they come under the total for nervous system. Through the digestive system, things affecting the face and then things affecting uh, respiratory system and then eyes and ears. So those are the most common ones. The table on the right-hand side, the column on the right-hand side, uh, is the same figures but excluding known chromosomal causes such as trisomy 21 Down syndrome. And you can see that the known chromosomal uh, defects contribute a small part, but only a small part, to the overall frequency of the uh, developmental defects. And people have interpreted these in complex and emotive ways in the past. Uh, the Romans regarded them as warnings from the gods. And they had effectively, I made this name up, I admit, a bureau of two-headed calves uh, if the number of animals born with abnormalities uh, increased, they interpreted that as a sign of the wrath of the gods and could actually take political action as a consequence of what they feared was going on. At the same time, continuing to much later, uh, there was the idea that a developmental abnormality was a consequence of some wrongdoing on the part of the parents, uh, of the mother or indeed the father that it was a consequence of sin or immorality. And then more recently still, uh, people, many people may still believe that there are what I've called proximate emotional causes. So the idea that if you were frightened by a spider, that you might have a spider-shaped birthmark. Or in the classic story of the elephant man, uh, it was suggested that his mother had been frightened by an elephant during the course of pregnancy and somehow by sympathetic magic that would lead to a defect 
So eating strawberries might give that kind of uh, skin mark called a strawberry nevus. All of these, of course, are completely untrue. In fact, I find animal analogies quite unhelpful in talking about developmental events. So there still is a tendency to draw parallels between human developmental defects and other forms of, of animals, uh, and this is irrelevant. There's no connection between them whatsoever. So in looking at the causes, we know very little, but what do we know? About 10% of an identifiable major chromosomal defect and about 8% have a single gene cause that we've already identified. Environmental factors, which often attract the most attention in people's minds, uh, we only know of about 7% of cases directly caused by an environmental factor. About 25% we know to be an interaction, so between the genes and something in the environment. And the whole 50%, we're still largely guessing at what's going on. One thing we do know is that there seems to be an association with poverty, that societies where people are living in social deprivation have higher numbers of developmental defects. And as a result, we can conclude that there may be in part a political solution to some of these kinds of issues. Very powerful techniques have arisen to identify genes which might be involved. And as our understanding of the genetic control of development increases, so in turn, we begin to understand better what some of the factors influencing developmental abnormalities might be as well. So the Human Genome Project was a huge step forward to identifying all of the genes that are involved in possible developmental abnormalities. As I hinted, the cause of developmental abnormalities that receives the most attention is not the genetic and chromosomal ones, which actually cause most of the abnormalities where we know of a cause, it's about factors in the environment. So again, there's an emotional component to that. People are very concerned that they might have done something or been exposed to something which caused an abnormality in their child. But one important thing to understand about this, something that's not generally well understood, is that there's generally not a specific relationship between a cause and an effect where one cause has a particularly clear outcome on the development of the baby. Perhaps the most famous agent which caused abnormalities, or teratogen as they are known, is thalidomide, which is a drug given to pregnant women uh, and has a very high likelihood of causing abnormalities. And people often think of the thalidomide defects as being related to limbs. And it's certainly true that they affect limbs but if you remember our diagram about frequencies, limbs are one of the things that frequently go wrong. And therefore, if you increase the total number of abnormalities, then you may well increase the number of limb abnormalities in a marked manner. In reality, we know that thalidomide caused a whole range of defects. And the time at which the mother was exposed to thalidomide is a significant factor. There are occasional agents which have very specific effects. So some antibiotics will specifically affect tooth development, for instance. Uh, but I would say that they are probably unusual rather than common. So again, bearing in mind that this is only a small proportion of all causes of developmental abnormalities, what are the kinds of environmental factors that might be involved? And I've classified them into three groups. So biological, physical, and chemical. Biological, one example might be infection with German measles or rubella. And this is something which can cause really significant abnormalities in the early stages, particularly during the embryonic period. So embryonic death or heart defects, eye and ear defects are all things that can commonly arise from the mother being exposed to rubella. And it's also why it's so important to maintain population levels of vaccination uh, at very high levels to make sure that pregnant women are not exposed to rubella in the community. Physical forces, and of those, the most common is x-rays. And therefore, good practice is never to irradiate, never to x-ray the abdomen 
of a woman of childbearing age unless you are absolutely confident that she's not pregnant. So a precautionary principle would say, do not x-ray the abdomen of a female of childbearing age. And that could be a very wide time span uh, since women could be pregnant from the age of 12 to the age of 60 these days. And therefore, caution is required under these circumstances. And then finally, there are chemical causes. And I've named thalidomide as being perhaps the classic example of that. But of course, these still represent a relatively small proportion of the total number of developmental abnormalities. But one of the problems that can arise is that parents often feel extremely bad about the fact that their child has been born with an abnormality. And even though it's inappropriate, they may well feel personally guilty, personally at fault. If, for instance, there was a genetic cause, there is absolutely no fault or blame that should attach to the parents. But nonetheless, people will often feel that. And sometimes they attempt to discharge that through finding something else to blame. So that's not an uncommon feature of parents of children with developmental abnormalities. They're looking for something outside themselves to blame, even though in reality they themselves were never to blame at all. Sometimes that takes the form of seeking compensation, but in my experience, that's not the main driver. The main driver is this emotional need to try and discharge the inappropriate guilt they feel by finding somebody else whose fault it might appear to be. So what can we do about this and where does prenatal diagnosis come in? There are a variety of things that we can now do, uh, for instance, amniocentesis, ultrasound scans, chorionic villus sampling, where we can look at what's happening during the course of the pregnancy. And this can give us various options, which I've listed on the left hand side of this picture. At the top, I put termination and this can have a significant impact on the frequency of a developmental abnormality. I've listed data for Paris, Glasgow and Dublin for dysraphic conditions, that's neural tube defects. And at first glance, you can see that the incidence is much lower in Paris than it is in Glasgow or Dublin. In fact, these kind of neural tube defects were sometimes called the Celtic curse. There may well be differences in the regional distribution of the abnormalities, uh, which reflect different genetic backgrounds in the population or perhaps it reflects different kinds of deprivation that you get in these areas. But Glasgow and Dublin are very similar in the incidence per 10,000 live births. But in Scotland, termination of pregnancy is legal, whereas in the Republic of Ireland, it's still something which is much more difficult for legal and cultural reasons. So you can see that the live birth rate of babies with a dysraphic neural tube defect in Glasgow is about 10 or 11 and in Dublin it's about 24, 25, even though the incidence is very similar. So termination of a pregnancy when a significant abnormality has been detected is one option and that, re that reduces the incidence of live births quite significantly. However, another option is preparation. And there are some conditions where uh, if you know that a baby is going to be born with certain, certain conditions, you can prepare a surgical team and deliver the baby by caesarean section uh, so that you know when the delivery will take place. Take the baby immediately to surgery. And for many kinds of surgeries, the sooner that can be done on the baby, the better. And the better the healing will take place subsequently. There's also a possibility of correction. And that might mean operating on the baby while it's still in the uterus. And that in itself is a challenging and dangerous thing to do. And therefore, only the most severe conditions are being explored for this. Neural tube defects would be an example. If it was possible to repair the neural tube defect before the baby was born, healing would be much better. And therefore, this is an area that might be explored further in the future. There's also the possibility of selection. Through in vitro fertilisation, you can fertilise the egg in a dish and then you can assay for some genetic conditions and select the pre-embryos that are going to be returned to the uterus. And that's already taking place. But finally, what I'd like to name is acceptance. 
that in some cases, the developmental disability is a problem for others, that they respond badly to it, and that more sympathy and understanding of the nature of developmental defects might make things better for the individuals who have them. Other things that we could do is to make sure that we test drugs for teratogenicity, for the possibility that they might cause abnormalities before they're released to the general population. And that's generally done through animal testing. Pre-implantation diagnosis, genetic testing and selection is going to be a factor. Genetic counselling, if you can identify people with a, an inappropriate combination of genes, it's possible to advise them in advance that this is the case. But I think probably a most significant one is good maternal, good maternal nutrition, making sure that the mother avoids things which might cause harm during the course of development. And as I said, poverty and deprivation seem to be key factors in that kind of process. So then, what can we summarise from this particular lecture? We've looked at the three main stages of development, the pre-embryo, the embryo and the fetus. We've identified the embryonic period from two and a half weeks after fertilisation to the end of the eighth week after fertilisation as that sensitive period where major abnormalities of body systems are detectable. We've looked at the causes which might underlie that, realising and accepting that we still have very much to learn in this area. And then we've looked at the implications for parents, children and medical practitioners of knowing that a developmental abnormality is present in a developing baby. Thank you very much.